Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, looks like we've got a few more people joining in with us, um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Morgan. Um, I am a member of Conservation Nebraska here. Um, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> um, we are here tonight with Gus, um, who runs and is the executive director down at Omaha Permaculture. We're gonna have a great evening. Um, a few things to go over, your cameras and microphones are turned off during this webinar, but if you do have any questions, please feel free to save those for the end as we should have some time to get those answered. You can go ahead and put them down in the chat or the Q&A. And, &A. and um, I do believe at the end, we will run a short survey just based on what you learned. If you learned anything, please feel free to fill that out for us. That kind of helps us plan some future events and we look forward to getting started. So I will pass it over to Gus. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Gus Von Rowan and I'm the founder and executive director of Omaha Permaculture. I'm very excited to uh, host this permaculture design series. Uh, this is the first of many of a permaculture design series we're going to be hosting throughout the year. Uh, and this one is going to be focusing on edible landscapes. Uh, I know I only have about an hour with you. I have quite a few slides I want to go through. Uh, I want to give you a primer on what is permaculture itself and uh, how, how is it different from all these other terms that we we see and we we're familiar with. Uh, and then I want to kind of talk a little bit about the design uh, component of permaculture. Uh, and, and then after that, we will talk a little bit about what we do as an organization, Omaha Permaculture, and how we implement some of those per principles into a nonprofit, an environmental nonprofit here in Omaha, Nebraska. So I am going to share my screen here and get the uh, slideshow going. There we go. All right. So we're going to be talking about edible landscapes and permaculture design today. So we will start with the main question of what is an edible landscape? And very, in a plain statement, it is a property that provides food all year round using minimal energy, water, and effort. Uh, this is the primary goal in permaculture design. Uh, permaculture itself, while it is, is uh, many things about sustainability, uh, it is guided by ethics. So it has three main ethics. One, take care of the earth. So earth care, take care of people, people care. And then any excess you have, you, you devote towards a community. So community care. So you have excess money, time, energy, materials, supplies, so forth. Uh, so this is an ethical way of maintaining sustainability in your community. Uh, and why do you want an edible landscape? And I don't know if you can tell the big smiles on my face, but I get excited when I harvest food that I grew uh, from a seed, you know, whether it's a tree or uh, here is a collard leaf as big as my head, bigger than my head. Uh, it's very exciting to, to, to go through the process and then feed yourself from your land uh, and in your own backyard. Uh, anybody can do it. Uh, even the mistakes end up being uh, tasty mistakes. Uh, as you can see from our community partners, mostly new Americans that are coming here to Omaha, uh, large new American refugee population, one of the largest in the country. Uh, we have vacant properties and we're, we're able to give enable land access so that we can see the smiles and see why everybody else likes to see and enjoy edible landscapes. Uh, so let's just dive into what is permaculture as a term. Uh, I have a long definition that I like uh, that is broken up into about eight sentences. So over the next eight slides, I'm going to be breaking up the kind of components of what makes good permaculture design and what, what are all the variables. Uh, 
you know, there are ways to simplify it, but I, I'm going to start with this more elaborate uh, explanation first. Uh, permaculture is, if it is nothing else, it is sustainable, sustainable land use design. Uh, also sustainable systems design. Uh, and you see in front of you, you see kind of uh, the potential of, of designing a landscape so that it, it has higher efficiency for if you wanted to grow food. You can see how the steep slopes, the ravines, uh, the actual creek itself, the flatlands, the lowlands, the areas that are facing the sun, the face that are, the air, the hills that are blocking the wind, the north wind. All of them have different potentials and different little microclimates that are are perfect for understanding uh, what is possible that you would be able to grow and understanding your landscape and why those places are better than other places for certain types of uh, cultivation is is important and it's something you learn throughout permaculture permaculture design is based on ecological and biological principles often using patterns that occur in nature to maximize effect while minimizing uh work and these patterns that you see in nature are uh you know something that we can take benefit from by incorporating it into design because uh the, the climate and the weather and the way that water moves and air moves, it, it distributes uh, nutrients and, and water uh, more efficiently if following patterns. Uh, so this is a good way to, to mimic and create design. Permaculture design aims to create sustainable productive systems that provide for human needs, harmoniously integrating the land with its inhabitants. So I, I look for a good picture that actually uh, kind of describes harmony with the landscape. Uh, and here you can see on the hilltops, they're, they're mostly undisturbed with some vegetation, uh, perennial vegetation, that even the deciduous nature uh, kind of trickles down into the lower grades of the landscape. And that's where you do cultivation. That's where water retention uh, is, endures longer. Uh, as well as being able to block the wind. So this is a really neat way of, of terraces demonstrating uh, highly efficient land use that potentially regenerates the soil. Uh, permaculture uh, benefits from the ecological process of plants, animals, their nutrient cycles, climate factors, and weather cycles. They are all part of the picture for when you consider design. As you can see here, we have like the little animal life cycles of insects and chickens, uh, all that happen at a seasonal component. You can predict when all of this happens. And then on the right, you, we have a, a kind of a depiction of what the climate happens and what happens even during a polar vortex, uh, what's currently happening. So understanding your climate and season and what your, uh, your environment is susceptible to is is very important when understanding how you design your, your landscape or your system. Uh, permaculture's inhabitants' needs are provided for using uh, proven technologies for food, energy, shelter, and infrastructure. And here you have a cross-section of what is called an earth ship. And an earth ship was uh, uh, designed and come up with as an architectural a way to build a home that is zero emissions uh, by Mike Reynolds in the late 70s. And he has built many of these homes all over the world. There's actually one out in, I believe it's Hastings, Nebraska. It's recently been finished uh, and she welcomes visitors. So I honestly recommend you to go uh, visit an earth ship if you ever get a chance. Uh, it, it, it basically cleans its own water, stores its own water, produces its own energy, uh, cleans even the gray water, uh, and, and even uses some of the, the, the gray water for, uh, for vegetables, basically, uh, and then recycling. One of the most important features is this rammed earth tire wall at the back. Uh, it's, it's one of the most important components. If you bank it south, it, it, it really absorbs a lot of the heat in your in your in your environment so it obviously has renewable energy and deals with water uh, grows its own food so uh this is an, another example of infrastructure designed by permaculture 
elements in a system are viewed uh, as a relationship to other outputs and in, in outputs of one element when they become the inputs of another uh, system. So basically we have a cycle. If you're imagining you have a farm or a homestead that there are never any wastes in your system. Try to understand what that, uh, you know, excess weeds and, and leaves and uh, anything that is a waste in your homestead. Uh, try to imagine as an input to another component of your system. If it's chicken, chicken waste or it's hay or it's leftover things that you can dry out of the kitchen, how does it become an input for another system on your farm? Within a permaculture system, Work is minimized, wastes become resources, productivity and yields increase, and environments are restored. So as you, this is a pretty much a, you know, uh, a, the perfect example in permaculture, you have a before and an after photo, uh, and it's it, it really can do a lot if you really know how to design the integration of, of bringing in seeds, bringing in drip irrigation, as this picture on the left clearly needed because uh, you know it, you can't just make it rain in some arid parts of the world, but what you can do is slowly assist uh, ecosystems so that drought tolerant plants can grow and take hold and succeed. And then allowing the succession of other more, uh, bent, you know, more favored plants for growing food and cultivation. So this is a great example of what permaculture can do over the course of time. Permaculture principles can be applied to any environment at any scale from dense urban developments to individual homes from far away and to close local regions. Uh, the left photo uh, we have is in North Omaha. It's one of our gardens uh, working with new Americans. It's about a two and a, two and a half acre property. Uh, and it's right behind a, a fire station and they provide the water, but it's feeding over 125 people. Uh, and then here on the right, we have Mark Shepard's farm in Illinois. He has designed, uh, I think, what is a 320-acre farm, according to permaculture principles. As you can tell, it doesn't look like a, a center pivot moment, and it doesn't look like, uh, you know, a tractor has gone over this very much uh, in terms of, you know, making a grid. Uh, this is done according to contour. A, a permaculture property uh, is, is using gravity to capture water and hold on to uh, the best soil. So if you can recognize here, this, this block here, permaculture is sustainable land use design. This is the definition I just went through right now, uh, through all of those previous slides there. I think this does a pretty good job of covering all the different principles that are inherent. You, you want to uh, mimic nature in a lot of respects, and it reflects in the way you design your property. Uh, if you wanted to do, just to kind of get permaculture going in your backyard, I've included this little six steps that kind of differentiate it from, you know, other, other approaches, but it definitely uh, gets your feet wet so that you learn a little bit about how to design your own backyard or your own homestead. But number one, catch and store rainwater. Two, grow your own food. Three, create your own resources. Four, build, retrofit your home to heat and cool itself. Five, reduce or create zero waste. And then six, this is what this is one of big one is get to know your neighbors. Uh, permaculture is all about the community and making sure that we're we're sharing resources and helping each other out. They're uh, making sure that people in your community are not slipping through cracks. That uh, we're helping each other out. It, it's, it's a strong ethic in permaculture. Uh, so I'm gonna continue on this uh, definition of permaculture because uh, just recently uh, I put together what I would call uh, a chart, a graph that I think attempts to try to parse all of these words. Don't feel like you need to absorb everything right here. I just built this and it maybe it looks a little busy, uh, but I, I, I feel like it, it, it tries to address a lot of the differences in the terms uh, so, uh, this webinar is being recorded, so you, you can definitely kind of take a screenshot of this, 
this particular uh, slide, or I could you could email later, and I can send it to you so you can look at it. But uh, I've just recently made this because I've had a lot of people question me about like how does it fit with re specifically regenerative agriculture. And I, I did a Google search and looked for something myself that really does an idea of does a good idea of explaining the relationship uh, between the two disciplines and two ideologies. Um, they're not they're they're not necessarily they overlap. They're not necessarily uh, mutually exclusive. They, there are a lot of things that uh, that we share in common. Um, and I, I I thought the concentric circle approach does a good job of demonstrating and expressing uh, these relationships. Uh, but over the next couple slides, I will flush out a few more uh, design principles uh, that I feel like we can kind of talk about, especially when on this left side here, when you say permaculture designs, tools, and concepts, uh, these are kind of, you know, some of the your, things you would use in your toolbox when you are designing, the things that you should consider when uh, putting uh you know, designing your happy backyard, as Bob Ross would put his happy little tree back there. How do you design it so that you're happy with it, uh, but also that it functions to uh, reduce the amount of labor and stress and and watering, all, all that is necessary. So it pretty much runs itself. Uh, but we will come back to this slide, uh, or please ask me later, um, and I can uh, email these out to people that are interested. Um, and so I have a few other kind of urban permaculture thoughts, because I think most people that are maybe attending this, this presentation are interested in like what they might be able to do in their backyard to turn it into an edible landscape. And so these last thoughts are just kind of building up for the design component here. Uh, so first and foremost, we are focusing on building good soil, soil that regenerates itself, healthy living soil. Uh, and hopefully we don't have to buy bag soil, uh, that we can use the leaves in the area. We actually make terraces. We use, you know, some of the soil that is, you know, better place in our yard at a low spot and maybe take that better soil and, and scoop it up and put it in the sunny spot with your garden. Uh, but soil is the most important. We want to make sure that we, we preserve it, we contain it and, and build it. Uh, so we start with that. Uh, and we can take a cue from nature or when you've watched a, a mulch pile just kind of sit there for too long and you go underneath for the inches, a, a few inches, you can see that it's breaking down. It's creating soil. And similarly, on the right photo, you have the picture of a forest. When you walk through the forest, you can feel your, you know, the, how soft the, the carpet and the ground is because it's, it's, there's, there's air, there, the, the microbes, the bacteria, uh, soil is being, is decomposing all of the nature in front of you and turning it right into soil. Uh, and then it becomes a sponge and a really healthy sponge for, for the next generation of plants and trees to grow. Uh, and then urban agriculture is, is nothing new. Here's a picture from 1917 in Delaware, uh, clearly in an urban environment. You know, it's, it's, it's something that's been practiced in our country for a long time. Uh, obviously, we have people from other countries that are bringing those traditions as well, but maybe they're more in a rural context. Uh, but the fact that people think that you can't grow food in your own neighborhood, in your community, in, a, in a, an urban environment, you know, uh, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. Being able to walk out your front door and go pick, you know, the, what is the season able to provide for you? And uh, this is something that... Uh, is easily done here in Omaha and throughout Nebraska. Uh, and this is a little bit more into the land management stuff, but it's definitely about urban agriculture. You know, when you see a big patch of grass, you know, it, it has to be maintained and mowed and tamed on a regular basis. And it really doesn't give you a lot of, you know, opportunity to, uh, to, to do much else with it. It suffocates a lot of other ambitions you might do with the property. Uh, so I uh, definitely question, you know, the, the maintenance and the work that we need to do to keep your lawn looking nice. If you have a nice sunny spot in the middle of your yard, uh, I would, I would recommend that you turn that, that spot into and, and remove that lawn and imagine something else. Uh, and community gardens are great ways to, to imagine urban agriculture. Uh, I personally believe that, you know, when you put 
dirt in a box uh, that you don't learn as much about the soil and the trees and the uh, the rejuvenation of the soil itself. Uh, I mean, if you're worried about lead in, in Omaha, which is definitely a legitimate concern, you know, a lot of these properties have already been remediated and the top few inches of soil have already been replaced. Uh, but you can still do uh, follow-up testing uh, with the cities and you can ask in Lincoln as well. Uh, so, but ultimately uh, I feel that we should be planting and using almost every inch of the, the property uh, and, and really invite yourself to, to make mistakes and learn where uh, some par parts of the soil and part of the property is maybe not ideal, but it might be better for some other plants or it might be a good for a path if it doesn't really want to you know grow anything at all. But ultimately learning something about the soil and learning about how to maintain the larger property itself, uh, I think is is a is a great way to begin uh, designing your community garden. Uh, and then you may have heard of the internet kind of uh, social media uh, blitz called Grow Food Not Lawns. If you have a south facing lawn in the front of your house and you're not in a neighborhood association or covenant that uh, limits your what you can do. I invite you to definitely grow food in your front southern facing lawn. Uh, there's ways to make it look nice, uh, and there are ways to kind of you know border it with with intentional kind of uh, floral plants that make it maybe look nicer and prettier for the neighborhood who the neighbors may complain. If they do, uh, make sure you you share a little bit of the bounty and share the vegetables. Uh, but I think most people these days are are more welcoming to uh, a well-maintained garden that is actually thinking about the aesthetics as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of the permaculture gardens, you know, uh, we don't necessarily use raised beds. We use more of an organic approach. We spread mulch throughout the areas and then in areas where there isn't mulch, uh, we kind of sow and we even let some of those plants grow past their harvest so that they overseed and they pro provide pollination. Uh, so really uh, having a, what is looks like a living property and a living garden, I think is, is, is more inviting and, and it invites people in and it, and, and you, you don't just necessarily see nature in boxes. Um, and then the heroes for why we do permaculture and urban agriculture are the insects. Uh, there are pollinators. They're the ones that show that even in an urban setting that we have healthy air, healthy water, healthy soil, and that we can produce food that is worthy for us to eat. Uh, you know, this is also an opportunity to, to give habitat for the birds and the bats. They all help with the ecosystem of keeping uh, kind of too many insects at bay sometimes. Some of the mosquitoes are, you know, proliferate too much. Uh, but being able to understand and balance an ecosystem, you need all of the all of the parts of the ecosystem, even in an urban setting. Uh, this is what we we find in uh, North Omaha vacant properties, sometimes underneath uh, vacant lot trash, uh, which is a northern prairie skink, uh, which is a very sensitive, vulnerable uh, animal. Uh, it's kind of a lizard, and it uh, has. Uh, a very, very fragile existence. Uh, and and if, if you were to spray or you mowed your lawn every week, you probably would not have a skink in your yard. They, they don't like to be disturbed much. They like to be in the rocks. So they like uh, properties that aren't, aren't walked through very often. And they live underneath some of that trash that has been dumped on vacant properties. Uh, but if, if something like a skink can live and exist in an ecosystem, uh, you know, you know, we're nurturing a healthy ecosystem, uh, and, and that's a lot of what, one of the main goals in permaculture. Uh, so we, we, we're not putting fences up for other animals that are happening to be walking through the neighborhood, the turkeys and the deer, they need to eat too. Uh, if you happen to be the only, only garden on the block, that's kind of getting hit by, uh, browsing, you know, uh, you know, that's just unfortunate, but at the same time, uh, you know, they, they're looking for food 
And if you're able to encourage neighbors or off of your property to encourage little satellite gardens and other places, you know, that uh, that draw uh, and grow food for impassively for nature as well, uh, because they're just looking for for food as well. And uh, instead of going to the store and buying bird feed and whatever it is, uh, you can actually passively grow the actual system to, to keep nature happy. Um, okay, now I'm going to focus almost specifically on some design components. What is permaculture design? And how uh, do these design uh, concepts uh, enhance your ability to, to, uh, to grow food much more efficiently? So... Here is a designer checklist, and one thing you may you may not be able to get it here right as a screen capture. Uh, I'll give you plenty of time to do that as as you want now. Uh, but these are a checklist of all the things that you should be doing when you do the first thing in permaculture. You have a brand new property in front of you, and you don't know what to do. You see the trees, you see, uh, you know, in front of you. You know what you want. You want a garden. You want some fruit trees. Uh, chicken coop, whatever it might be, but spend some time over the course of a year. A year is perfect because you can watch it go through all the four seasons and you want to kind of take note of where things are, uh, the activities of neighbors, as it mentions here. One of my favorites is water. If you can see it, it's on the second column about halfway through. Uh, flooding zones, drainage patterns, creeks, gullies, water movement during rain. I think that one's one of the most important. Uh, and then also uh, microclimates, rocky outcrops, good views, bad views, uh, and then down areas of shade and sun and how they change over the year. That's actually, to me, the another most important one, simply because I, I really like greenhouses and you want to be able to site a greenhouse in a place that you know is not going to get shaded uh, in winter. So the sun is lower in the sky, you know, as a lower winter azimuth, and you want to make sure that there is an adjacent building or adjacent garage that is shading your greenhouse. So though that's something that you want to consider, uh, at least when you design and lay out your property. Uh, so there's a whole checklist here. I think these are all decent things to think about. As you watch your property and you consider what you want to do for your backyard or your homestead. Um, and here's a little example. So your left left hand side is it's kind of an overview, a typical permaculture design overlay. Uh, and I don't know if you can see in the lower left, but there uh, is concentric circles and it's broken into zone one, zone two, zone three through zone five. And all of those zones uh, are identified concentric about around your dwelling or around if, if it's just a vacant lot, then it's it's where you have the best sun and then you kind of uh, you know filter away from that. Uh, but every property, every design site should be broken up into zones that reflect how close you are to the garden. And then if you have enough land, you can go all the way out to a zone four and a zone five when you, you're considering five acres and more, five and 10 acres and more. Uh, but this that zone uh, concept is very important when you consider design. And that even makes sense in your own backyard. Uh, you, as For example, you're not gonna go all the way to the back fence every day of your life. So that may be zone two, uh, but you will be going through the walkway as you go to the, the driveway or you walk outside every day, that is you're always gonna be your zone one. And then on the right, uh, cycles are constant in, in permaculture as a theme. Uh, this producer, consumer, decomposer cycle are very important in understanding and nurturing this cycle so that you don't have just a, a yard that you're constantly cleaning up and making it feel tidy and manicured. Basically, you want to have a little bit of messiness, a little bit of decomposition in areas, and you want to encourage that so that to your trees and your shrubs and your berries, everything has an opportunity to kind of flourish as a as an ecosystem that is not manicured and maintained and 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 deliberately uh, kept tidy. Uh, 
we basically need, as it says, in most yards, the decomposers, the worms, bacteria, fungi, and other soil creatures are neglected, which starves the producers and in turn consumers of resources. If each link flourishes, the others grow stronger too. And that that's, we want a healthy system of creating this regeneration in your soil. And here is a, a little flush out of that earlier concept of zones, zone one through five, if you can see here. I won't leave this very long if you need to do a screen capture, uh, but what are the things you could be doing uh, per zone one, per zone two, and then backed up, you know, things that actually are more hands-off as you get to zone three and zone four if you have a bigger property. Uh, so this is, these are things that, uh, you know, guide your design strategy when you're you're doing uh, design. And then here's a really important component when doing design is understanding both canopy and root structure of the plants and trees and shrubs that you're growing because they all can help and complement and be very congruent uh, in a certain situations. And you can try this over many years, but you know that the uh, you know, there are a lot of plants that grow in the shade of other plants and trees, and especially in our recent hot summers when we, we get those really, really hot days and peak sun and peak heat is at 3 p.m. in the day. Well, some of our plants, it'd be, they would love to have a little shade respite and uh, that inter forest layer approach that we you can see here benefits a lot of of the plants around them if they can get just a little bit of respite and a little bit of shade and you find that actually you're not compromising much by them skipping a little bit of that hottest day of the shade moments uh and and actually the heat is retained and even a cool forest environment uh could be uh very beneficial for everything that's growing in it, both uh, plant life and non-plant life. Uh, another neat uh, the permaculture design concept that's kind of uh, the flagship, so to speak, uh, is, is an herb spiral. So this is kind of a top-down look at it, but if you were to look at it from the side, you can make it as tall as your waistline, if not taller. Uh, but the, the spiral itself is made from just, you know, anything concrete or brick rubble uh, that you can find, you know, that, that looks nice, but functions as a, as a good structure to, to retain the soil that you're going to put in there. Uh, and I, at, at that spiral, that Fibonacci spiral that, you know, we see re recreated in nature, uh, it does a decent job of, of kind of displaying all the potential herbs you could have in your herb spiral. Uh, so there are a lot of people that, um, you know, focus on on creating an herb spiral and putting that right outside your patio or right outside your front door on your way to your car all these places in a very nice convenient spot so that you can just harvest some herbs as you're walking into the kitchen on the way there uh so the herb spiral has a is, an, is a really neat design a really neat design concept that actually could have some practical use uh and it and it looks nice when it all flushes out so uh, this is something that uh, is a really neat design element. Um, this is a really nice one, the perennial edible sun trap. And uh, the, the yard on the right is an example of one and how we planted one. And the top photos with, you know, we're planting in spring with just uh, water can irrigation, but just to get the seeds going. But we didn't water that property for the rest of the year, and you can turn, you can see that even with you know a month of of low rain, we actually had a very flourishing property, and it's because this property, you know, done correctly, a perennial edible sun trap traps in heat, it it blocks wind, so wind evapotranspiration, and uh, you're if done correctly, you're extending your season on the fall side almost a month and you're extending your season on the spring side almost a month uh, and that's just the way it lines up in in our particular climate here in zone 6a I guess now we are uh, so um, 
basically, this is a very useful way, and you could be doing it at, a, at about a quarter acre and anything bigger than that. Uh, the 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 arch, the protection you can see of the trees there in the back could also be your neighbor's backyard, uh, and the 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 houses, apartment complexes. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the trees, but you're actually creating kind of a mini south facing courtyard. Uh, someone may have heard the term Hugel culture. Uh, Zepp Holzer, who came up with this concept, is uh, he he likes to use the term agroecology. Uh, but I have seen him at many permaculture events, uh, and this concept is a very good permaculture uh, strategy. And it's it is created by your your burying uh, uh, trees and stumps and twigs, both uh, alive and dead. Uh, so different shades of green in in that regard, because the. the you, once you bury it with the the uh, uh, with excess soil uh, and a little bit of mulch, uh, you're basically creating a big mound. That is, you know, you can make it as tall as 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 myself, which I'm six foot, or you could kind of make it so that it's waist high. But the benefit to planting your garden on this mound is that you're you're plucking and harvesting at waist height, uh, and then over time, every year that mound is going to sink a little bit as the nutrition is consumed. But that's the real uh, benefit to a hugel culture is that you do not have to fertilize this system. It, uh, all the fertilizer is built into the, uh, the buried uh, organic matter that is done early in the stage of its design. Uh, and then uh, sometimes they, they cycle out if you do it at a little backyard scale, but if you're able to do it at bigger scale, you know, they, they can last up to 10 years. Uh, but this is a really neat uh, self-regenerating design concept of, of how to keep soil uh, well with, with good nutrition for, for over many years. And moisture. This creates a great sponge. And I think this imitates, you know, when a tree falls over in the woods, it, it you know, brings up its root ball and it buries things when it does all that. I think uh, Zepp Holzer just observed this in nature and saw that uh, there was a lot more nutrition buildup in these little pockets of, of uh, kind of overlap and, and uh, uh, burying of organic matter. Um, other things to consider uh, that are, are design elements is understand the expansive root systems, understand shade and shelter components of your trees, that the fact that there's not just fruits, but there's also nuts. Uh, and then wood can be harvested afterwards. Uh, trees and shrubs provide animal insect habitat, the soil properties that go hand in hand with, with kind of an agroforestry approach. And then vines, vines can cover things and shade things as well. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, tools in the toolbox and it includes, you know, how do you maintain the land so that it looks nice in an urban setting, but it also is somehow regenerating that soil. Uh, so sometimes a, a tree dies in your neighborhood. Well, that's a perfect way to kind of upcycle it and then use it within that community uh, to its best uh, utility. Uh, not everything is has outdoor capacity, uh, but sometimes you can use that wood indoors or uh, help, you know, as long as you keep the, the moisture away from it. Uh, there are many trees in Nebraska that that are perfectly worthy of being at Home Depot and, and creating a two by four. Uh, so uh, there are many, many potential ways to upcycle and reuse the wood and the dying trees in your neighborhood. Um, and then cover crops. Uh, is just an example of, you know, in, in a low part of the season when, you know, the, maybe the garden's not looking great, but you have a cover crop that can go through there that is not only regenerating the soil, but it's also creating a mini pollinator moment. Uh, and then a little bit of an aesthetics uh, of maybe something that looks better than just a mowed property or dump trash in some, some situations. Um, and, you know, there's other ways to spread, in, you know, plants on on uh, in an area that you want to kind of quickly take over uh you know you, you can use um borage you can use uh tea tulsi 
You can use uh, squash plants themselves. They like to vine all over and take over a whole property. Well, they just make these little uh, umbrella leaves. And, you know, you don't really have to mow that area as much because uh, it is taken over. So that's another way to kind of work with the land. And as I mentioned, plants for tea, uh, you know, those are things we don't really think about, but that's a really neat cultivated crop and ed necessarily edible, but medicinal and, and soothing, uh, you know, especially during these cold, cold months, it's nice to have a warm cup of tea. Um, and then lastly, so I went over a lot of these concepts and designs and principles. It's like, uh, how does uh, the, my nonprofit, Omaha Permaculture, try to apply those principles to urban green spaces. So what we do is work with vacant properties. So this is a, a, a snapshot of vacant land around North Omaha and Adams Park. And every one of those little black rectangles is a vacant lot. So this is a high density of a lot of vacant properties that the city would have to go in and mow. They have to, they have to put, you know, they have to do tree maintenance. There's a lot of big old trees in North Omaha. Uh, and then if you can imagine all the windblown trash that accumulates on these fence lines and everything. So there's a lot of maintenance and there's a lot of potential with vacant properties if they were stewarded and they were being maintained by a garden group. Um, and so we try to do many things beyond uh, just the vacant lots. We, uh, Our mission is to foster community through sustainable land stewardship. And we are consultant to many groups in designing edible community green spaces. We collect organic waste from restaurants, churches, and build and do composting building uh, on our sites and farms. We work with community groups to enhance neglected vacant land, and we work with ecological soil building techniques. Uh, and then we also maintain landscapes for paying clients. Uh, but we are becoming one of the lead protectors and defenders of community urban green spaces in the face of urban development. Uh, affordable housing is an important need uh, for our Midwestern cities. Uh, we, we have low inventory, so we, we need to be building better new homes uh, for, for people that are moving here and calling Nebraska home. But at the same time, there are some properties that aren't, aren't really fitting for, our, for some of this urban development, and they uh, definitely deserve to be uh, maintained as a green space because they provide a lot of soft uh, health benefits that uh, are very measurable, cleaner air, cleaner water, um, you know, just basically a, a feeling of, of you know, the, that you live in a healthy, beneficial community. Uh, here is another map uh, that backed out into our Douglas County. All of those little dots are vacant properties. This is an older map. It's about 10 years old, but it really hasn't changed much. Uh, so not only is it just an urban problem, you know, where most of the city, you know, most of the homes are, but it is a countywide problem. And I'm sure if we went even to small towns of Nebraska, that that it's we were finding out it's a rural problem too. Uh, so vacant properties are opportunities, and that's the way uh, what our, our what our nonprofit identified early as an opportunity to to build edible landscapes. Oops, we did it again. So here's a, a vacant property that was normally dumped on. And uh, we uh, come on the property and we help the city out. We clean it all up. And then we put a sign on it with a phone number. And uh, we try to maintain the curb appeal. And we try to most importantly deter future dumping. Uh, and that's mostly by just keeping it clean and making it look like someone's maintaining it, uh, maintaining a curb appeal, uh, picking up trash if it does accumulate. Uh, so just be really reactive for vacant properties. And we identify some of the best vacant properties that have big potential for growing a community garden. And we hold on to these properties for a little bit of, you know, the beginning of, of the growing season until we can find a, a refugee new American group that, or, or anyone interested in the community, uh, we're open to anyone that phone number is for everybody. Uh, anybody can call us and reserve and find a, a vacant property. Uh, so we help and enable wh whoever is interested to, to source water, to get, uh, tillers, to get mowers, to get anything that is necessary 
to begin the growing season uh, as as early as April, sometimes March. And we work with many different groups uh, that help kind of maintain the properties. We build picnic tables, we build picnic benches, uh, we build uh, tool sheds, garden signs, uh, a lot of garden infrastructure that uh, you know allow us to to host larger groups so that we can be there, work there, have a little you know rest moment at the end of the day, maybe have a little picnic itself. Uh, but because that's really the whole point of a community garden is bringing the community together and enjoying a meal. Uh, so over the years, we've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of people in the Omaha community and all of these pictures. Uh, and uh, we, we, we learn a lot from their ways of growing. Uh, so we, we definitely are, are sourcing a lot of knowledge that is coming from the North Omaha community itself. And uh, we, we learn and share that knowledge with everybody else. Uh, and another thing we do with the, the, the land in general, we maintain it. We try to take care of it so that it doesn't get dumped on again. Unfortunately, when contractors mow the vacant properties, uh, they don't really get off the tractor to help pick up the trash. It's really just spread. Uh, so that's something that we focus on is to make sure that we have distinguishable, uh, distinguished land and it looks nice. Um, one of the really, uh, I guess, important resources we've, we've developed over the years is a Nebraska-centric permaculture field manual. And then most recently after the pandemic, a nine-week educational curriculum, mostly focusing on people that are uh, at the high school level uh, and younger. Uh, but uh, it's most, spo it's most specifically uh, compared to other permaculture educational curriculums, we are trying to present the material uh, with less science. Uh, there's a lot of science in permaculture and sometimes it's, it's, it's a lot of science. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of people that are attracted to this sustainability world, but don't want to really trudge through a lot of the science. Uh, and, uh, you know, it definitely explains it a lot better. And I encourage you to to get into it, but not everybody is into science. And so I don't necessarily want to create a platform of educational uh, learning uh, that maybe forces some things down pe people's, uh, you know, educational, uh, you know, plate so that they can see other ways to uh, uh, to get excited about the material. And uh, because being able to grow food, you don't necessarily need to be a science whiz. You, you need to just be a nurturing person, someone that pays attention to the seed you just planted, the chicken that you're raising, uh, the, the greenhouse that you just planted uh, and just built. Uh, so I'm, we're truly trying to eliminate a lot of barriers. And so this 30 page manual we, we designed back in 2017 is done in an almanac fashion so that you can go page to page by the month. And then here in January and February, you can look at the potential steps and checklists of things that you might be able to do. You may not be able to do a whole lot in this really extreme cold, but at least being able to see what you might be able to do in the upcoming months or being preparing for in the upcoming months. Uh, it is nice to see this in a nice little 30-page pamphlet. We also have this on our website free as a PDF. Uh, Omaha Permaculture, we've been collecting BioBlitz data. Uh, we have collected everything living that is uh, an insect, a plant, a tree, uh, or a bird uh, on at, at least nine properties over the course of now nine years. So we are hoping to publish uh, this information and this data collection, which really tells the story of climate change coming through Omaha. And uh, we uh, hope to publish this, like I said, at the in the urban ecology section of transactions of the Nebraska Academy of Sciences uh, within the next few years. Uh, we have a new headquarters at 40th and Grant Street. Uh, as you can see, it's right there in the middle where the little red dot is. And we are around a, a low-income community. Uh, the average income is around 29,000. Uh, and it's a light industrial corridor. There's you know kind of uh, metal quonsets and uh, um, industrial organization or industrial uh, businesses around us. 
Uh, so this is a really interesting and perfect place to build a, a permaculture uh, headquarters and community center. Uh, and then as mentioned earlier, this is a property that uh, we are growing food with the Karen and uh, people from Southeast Asia. It's two and a half acre property. It's one of our best and biggest garden sites. Uh, we also have at our headquarters space, we do vacant lot tree to lumber. All of the, the, the vacant properties that have trees that are being felled, we are turning those those logs into lumber when we uh, bring a miser onto our property and we mill them about twice a year then we dry them taking about almost three quarters of a year it's a long patient process uh, and then that wood we can re reimagine them as projects for building the, our picnic tables and other garden infrastructure uh, here is an example of what we do with our community uh, gardens, and you can see the infrastructure. There's a community uh, sign, community garden sign, uh, picnic table. Uh, there's a pallet tool shed there in the back background. Uh, but ultimately, most importantly, we're trying to find and hook up with the, the community champions of the neighborhood, people that are community leader. They are uh, coordinating the garden and watering uh you know, schedule. And then they're also the lead designer. So they need to maintain it. And they also keep everybody uh, working in the garden. Uh, another thing we do at Omaha Permaculture is we have backyard egg laying hen education. Uh, we have uh, hens at this property and we've been feeding uh, pantries, uh, homeless food pantries throughout the pandemic. Uh, but in the meantime, we host workshops during the warmer months about how to design your own coop and run, uh, but also how to reduce your feed costs because you can supplement with food coming out of your compost and your, your kitchen scraps. Uh, basically, we're able to talk about all best practice for a healthy flock. And if you are all curious, our hens are still doing just fine in this negative 20, negative 15 degree weather. They're outside. Uh, they don't have any special heaters or anything just to, just to keep the water from freezing. Uh, so they're doing great. Uh, they're not laying as much when it's this cold, uh, but they are laying in winter as long as uh, it is warm enough to do that. So, uh, But this is a great way to create an edible landscape in your backyard uh, and, and even create a little protein ball for you in the middle of January and February when your garden necessarily isn't doing anything. Uh, and then we have cold frame greenhouses down at at, at, uh, at uh, our new headquarters, and we're showcasing that you can grow vegetables. Granted, they're growing slower here in winter, uh, but they are being uh, cozy in this little plastic frame. And uh, if you uh, are the size of these cold frames that uh, we like to, to teach people how to design are a 12 by 20, we think this is a, a good scale for someone's backyard. Uh, because if you're creating a little salad garden for your backyard in winter, you need a little bit more space. And uh, these you can create with garden beds or use the existing garden soil itself. Uh, but it's nice to be able to, to go out into your, your cold frame and, and, and be able to feed yourself or in your family uh, with, with kind of a, a slower growing uh, a cold frame setup. And, and it, in, in the summer, you can remove the plastic and then you can turn it into a summer garden bed as well. Uh, so it can be dual purpose used all year round. Uh, so we have this new headquarters. This is one of our renderings looking south uh, towards the city of Omaha. Uh, we're a little bit in North Omaha, uh, just east of Benson. And what you see in front of you is an eight and a half acre property where we plan on doing a lot of demonstration workshops. Uh, host a community center, and there's even going to be a bike trail. Uh, and then lastly, this is one of our last few slides here. Uh, you know, people that want to create an edible landscape, you know, and are maybe a little intimidated, uh, I encourage you that get out there and plant some seeds of some of the vegetables you're curious about and you're interested in trying to learn more about. Please get them in the ground and do it when you see rain or you're able to water them in really well. Uh, 
and don't really worry too much about the maintenance of the year. Let's say you left for a few months during summer. Uh, this particular picture here on the countertop is uh, one of our first years where we had very excited interns to help plant the property, but I couldn't get anybody to help me maintain the property and maintain the weeds throughout the summer. And so I, I was a little defeated and I said, okay, well, we didn't get out there and, and clean it, but you know, we went back in September and October and looked underneath all of those weeds and we could see that actually we had a bounty of food. Uh, so even lazy gardening is better than not gardening. Uh, if you have a, the property that, uh, you know, you can try to, to grow your own food, I encourage you to try to do it. Don't wait for everything to get all ready for you to try it or, um, you know, to, to go get expensive raised beds or, and get the soil. You know, if you have a patch of yard in your backyard that you don't want grass in and has good, good sun, give it a shot. Uh, you know, you, you the worst you're going to get is you're going to get some food. Um, so Omaha Permaculture, we try to work with vacant properties and try to maintain uh, and improve and enhance that vacant property soil so that we can pass it off and enable gardeners to have uh, access to, to vacant properties and land. So thank you for listening today. I hope uh, this was uh, informative for how to create an edible landscape. Uh, in your backyard or in your homestead or how to design it. There's quite a few cheap features. Um, there's, there's much more content. There's a lot you can find on YouTube. There's a lot you can find in reading materials with you know, some of the, the permaculture greats uh, that kind of flush out some of these principles a little bit more if you're curious. Uh, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of primer and uh, let's see if, how I did with time today. It looks like we did it just within the hour. Uh, so I uh, went through 60 slides. Thank you for your patience, uh, death by PowerPoint. But uh, if anybody has any questions right now, I'll def definitely be able to answer them. That was great. We do, we have a couple of questions in there. So I will Ooh. go ahead and read those to you real quick here. Um, one of our listeners wants to know, have you seen an increase in homeowners incorporating the permaculture system into their homes? We've seen an increase in homeowners incorporating the permaculture system. Yes, into the homes. If we're talking about inside the homes, uh, my favorite way to, to, to incorporate it in the home is having a lean-to greenhouse. Uh, I think a lean-to greenhouse put on the south face of your, your building or your house or uh, you, know, you could have an open passageway that bleeds into your house itself, but that sunroom or greenhouse on your lean to south face will passively heat it uh and not less so on these cold days but uh but you know you can share the heat from the house to the greenhouse i don't know if i'm reading your question too literal but uh i think the lean to is the best example of how to incorporate good design into your house uh, if I were to elaborate maybe into the house a little bit more, if I'm, uh, is, you know, doing something with your South facing side, or if you're protecting your plants from the harsh sun of summer, maybe plant or having certain plants that are, uh, you know, you need to protect more, putting them on the North face of your house in, uh, summer. Uh, simply because they're, it's going to stay cooler. It's going to be in the shade um, compared to the hot summer temperatures we get. Uh, your house is a great opportunity to use each face and each part, nook and cranny, as a benefit of incorporating permaculture into the design and how it's oriented and how it blocks the cold north wind and how it you know is facing south, the sun. Uh, all those are important ways to think about you know uh you know what belongs in certain in, in in your yard and uh what what are those design considerations uh some things may grow better inside your west window window sill versus your east window sill i would always recommend a south window sill but not everybody has a south window sill so east and west you know they have their their 
pros and cons, but it's definitely possible. You just may end up having to assist the lighting a little bit more if you want to, if you want a little cherry tomato or something like that. Uh, anyway, there's ways to incorporate permaculture into the house, definitely. Uh, but I, you know, being able to to have the amount of sun coming in and basking uh, the plants is really the the biggest goal. Awesome. Another question we have, um, how does the cold frame greenhouse hold up to our winds? Oh, well, actually they do just fine. Uh, in previous years when I was testing them, because we have them situated on our property in a very open area. They're not, there's no trees around them block. There are no buildings to block the wind. Uh, they're doing just fine. And they, they're being held up by two by twos, not two by fours, two by twos. Uh, and uh, then the, the ribs, which is just electrical conduit. Uh, but as I was meant, about to explain the first couple of years, I used to put wind barriers that were big pallets to, to block the North wind. And I thought they insulated more. I, uh, basically I, I felt like I was over engineering it because the, they stand fine. They stand just fine without, without the, you know, the wind hitting it. Um, and then, you know, when the snow accumulates on top of those cold frames on that plastic, it just takes a little bit of, you know, the day's heat. And because of the slope, the snow just falls off. Like I almost never have to push the snow off of it because it's always melting all of the snow off of it. And, uh, and then that snow is kind of locking it in. So it's definitely not going anywhere with the wind now. So great question. Um, another question we have, can anyone visit the 18th and Burdett garden? Yes. Anybody can visit that. Uh, it's probably not a whole lot you can look at right now. Uh, but yes, once it's going, uh, and they start early, they start as soon as the ground thaws, usually in the end of March, uh, and they're out there kind of fi fixing it all up and it's beautiful. They have all these trellises uh, that that uh, grow the gourds and the gourds hang underneath kind of a ceiling of the vegetation. It's beautiful. It's really neat to see. And uh, at that scale, at two and a half acres, um, you know, uh, that particular mission church, they have now done that same concept for other places in town. So I don't know if we can brag at two and a half acres if it's still the biggest in town uh, because they're doing they're during the pandemic. They just grew and exploded and 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 they have a lot of people in their congregation that want want green space it's fantastic um another question we have is geared just for you specifically um somebody is wondering they are looking for a speaker to present on permaculture do you do speaking engagements i do yes okay. anytime i've spoken in front of every gardening group uh I just like to know the audience sometimes, what age group and what people are mostly interested in, if, if backyard, you know, help. Uh, I, I'd be happy to do that. Fantastic. Um, that's all the questions I have. I'm assuming hopefully we will send out your info or we can to that, um, that guest that asked that question. Um, but as far as that goes, it looks like that's everything we've got um, in the Q&A for tonight. Well, great. Yeah. Well, if you have questions, you can reach out at our website, omahapermaculture.org. Uh, that web, that, uh, that customer or that portal uh, goes to my email, info at omahapermaculture.org. Uh, so I see that. Uh, so feel free to kind of browse around our website and see what we do uh, and see some of the maps and see and even see that field uh, field manual almanac. Well, yeah, this was I great. had a question really quick to ask Gus, <laughs> just for the public. Sorry for interrupting sure. you, Morgan. Oh, you're um, okay. For anybody who wants to get involved in Omaha permaculture, uh, would they send you an email? How do they reach out to you? And what kind of opportunities do you have for people to get involved? Great question. And I wish I would have addressed that earlier, but, uh, it, we definitely have seasonal offerings of things to do. So in this bitter cold, uh, we don't have a whole lot going on in our kind of uh, 
you know, our, our kind of garage setting and, and greenhouse settings, everything is a little bit dormant right now, but as soon as it, you know, the temperatures do warm up a bit, uh, we have plenty of things that we're trying to do uh, on the property that are getting gardens ready for the next season. So we paint garden signs, we build garden signs. Uh, we we're working on this new property. We just, we just bought. So we're kind of, uh, we're insulating the property. We're getting or insulating the building, making it warmer. So there's a lot of like uh, just enhancement of the property itself. But ultimately, if you reach out to us and how can you get involved and you're also looking to kind of gain permaculture insight and knowledge. Uh, I don't necessarily want you to come to our property and need. I don't want to put you to work on some chore list. Uh, I want to pair you up with some of our curriculum, uh, you know, weekly curriculum lessons that we've built up over the years uh so so hopefully we will pique your passions and your interests so that we're not just giving you a chore list but we're also uh trying to work with the things that you're interested in and what the things that you want to learn from okay, okay. we have uh one more question that somebody just put in the chat is how do you deal with the cold frame greenhouses in the summer so great question so in the summer we remove the plastic about uh up to the kind of waistline there because there's a, a rib that goes around the, the side. Uh, we keep them up because the groundhogs, uh, even though we have cultivated, you know, vegetables in there, the groundhogs do like to walk in there when, you know, you're, you're nurturing baby plants, excuse me. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we, we're using painter's plastic, so it doesn't last very long, especially when you've got, uh, the UV and the sun, uh, on it almost for eight months nonstop. Uh, so during the summer, we kind of remove the plastic uh, and allow those those plants that we planted early in the year to kind of explode out of it, like a chia head or a chia plant. And uh, so the, the tomatoes and the green peppers and all the things that we were having in there, you know, they kind of take over the frame of that cold frame. And so uh, it allows to kind of just blow out past it. Um, but, uh, and then come fall then you kind of cut back some of those trees and plants as you feel the temperatures swinging down and then you can maybe start, begin starting to cycle out those summer plants and cycle in cold weather plants you know in the august september range uh, so you are doing kind of a crop rotation in cold frames from winter to summer and you're choosing different types of plants i hope that answers it Amazing. Thank you so much, Gus, for being here with us tonight. Thank you, everybody, for attending our webinar. Thank you, Morgan, for being such a good host and being the face of uh, Conservation Nebraska tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.